think another couple of minutes. This meeting is being recorded um, for the benefit of those who are missing out today. Um, okay, so um, today what we are discussing is this wonderful campaign called Art and Feminism, which is celebrating its 10 years today. Um, but specifically also um, in relation to galleries, libraries, archives, museums, we call them GLAMs. And uh, what, why should GLAMs organize um, if you're affiliated with a GLAM, if you can partner with a GLAM institution to organize an art and feminism event? If you're still unsure about what art and feminism really is, uh, Kira hosted a session last, um, I mean, there was another session earlier about what art and feminism is. So I would recommend going back to our YouTube channel and checking that session out. Um, there's also going to be a little bit of a, a, a discussion on how art and feminism as an organization supports you, the kind of resources, funding, um, any kind of support that we offer. And uh, of course, we will wait for any questions that you have, any thoughts that you have, any ideas that you've come up with and just see how we can make something possible. So it's this is really like the broad structure, but um, feel free to raise your hand, um, say something if you have a thought. So we'll keep it uh, the way art and feminism communities are lively. And um, yeah, that, that's how we'll go. So um, I'm going to start with a little about Wikipedia and the internet. On the left of my screen, there is a, there's a graphic that says October 22. That's the latest report that we have from We Are Social. They do this very interesting internet survey every year. And um, I mean, it's a deep survey, but the thing that interests us most over here, and especially for today's discussion to get us started with, is the fact that there are about 58% people who access the internet for finding information. That's their reason for using the internet. And what is the kind of information that they look for? What do they do? Um, you know, that brings us to Wikipedia a lot because more often than not, the first search result is always a Wikipedia page, if there is a Wikipedia page, that is. If there is no Wikipedia page about someone you're looking for, the chances are that you will have these different links. And um, sometimes you may not even know which link is reliable, which one you can trust, which one you, you know, is free from any conflict of interest, um, and which one would have all the information that you're needing. So this is one of the reasons why we feel that absences on Wikipedia echo across the internet. And this is one of the big reasons we edit Wikipedia. And then there is this very common question that I have personally often faced within museums when we conduct these sessions on art and feminism that can we rely on Wikipedia because it's edited by anybody can edit Wikipedia, right? So can we really rely on Wikipedia? Now, a way that we like to look at this question is that yes, Wikipedia is edited by volunteers. It can be edited by anybody. So it can be edited by you as well. <laughs> you who could be a glam professional, who you could, you could be someone who's just passionate about a topic. You could be someone who's a scholar about a certain topic. So yes, Wikipedia can be edited by anybody. That's one of its biggest strengths. Um, but also one of and the core things that we work around with institutions is that institutions like museums and libraries are repositories of knowledge. So with, with the support of these institutions, Wikipedia can be made a lot more reliable um, with the right information. We know that today we live in a time where misinformation spreads really easily, which is why it's even more important that libraries, archives, museums lend their resources and make it publicly accessible on a website like Wikipedia, which can be uh, translated into different languages and really has the kind of reach that most institutions on their own cannot um, sometimes reach. Um, one of the things, for instance, we have a quote from William Benton Museum of Art, and in the presentation today, we are going to bring in a lot of different references to museums, libraries, and their experience of um, hosting. 
an important thing here in the first quote is that information must be pulled from independent third parties as, as opposed directly from an artist's web page. There is a lot that any student or anybody who's attending a Wikipedia editathon at a library or a museum takes away. And this is one of the main things, understanding reliable sources, spotting um, conflict of interest. Uh, we do have different references on that. And maybe this is something that museums can really help with by offering their um, resources. The other quote is from Vanessa Kam, who's the, uh, who's again, who mentions that we have collections and reference material of amazing artists, the editathons, to connect our materials, the idea is to connect our materials to the growing body of content online um, and increase the presence of female artists on a popular reference site. So this, these are some of the main takeaways for um, an institution that is hosting. So again, I'm saying that in case you're an individual who's joining us today, whether you're, um, whether you represent, um, whether or not you represent a gallery, library, archive, or museum, do look at these as an ideal partner to add on to your editathon experience. <clears throat> um, another reason, again, I, I don't want to be like, okay, why should you host an all? But really, this is one of the ways, you know, this is one of the best ways to create visibility for your resources and collections, um, having them cited. For a lot of institutions, uh, especially there are scholars who write books for you, who write essays for you, who have used your collections in different essays and books. This is the time to actually help create awareness about these scholarly works and maybe even drive back citations, uh, you know, enable that information to go beyond the book or the essay into a huge public domain site where anybody can really access that information because that's why your institution has really helped or um, you know lent its collection for you like you know the interpretation of it in a scholarly manner so um, that is one of the things to have your um, your resources and collections be more visible online the other part is of course it being available in different languages uh, one of the very interesting things that happened with an editathon that I was personally involved with was seeing that how an Indian artist's work, because she was part of uh, the first Bauhaus exhibition that happened in uh, the city of Calcutta way back in the 1920s. We had little information about her in India, but it was actually a German institution that had more information. And when the German Wikipedia page for her came around, it was easier to translate and gain more information about her English Wikipedia page. So because of Wikipedia's large uh, volunteer base and the community, it really helps to put information out there in different languages because you really don't know how it can add to another body of work as well. And then of course, there's the access to a huge global community of volunteers, which again, it, it would be a challenge, I imagine for a lot of institutions to achieve that kind of a scale of um, volunteers who would maybe even just add images from your online collection, which are in the public domain, properly licensed onto a Wikipedia common, onto a Wiki Commons page. So uh, those kind of activities really help uh, different institutions uh, grow. On the right, you see that, that it's, a, it's a French zine that has been created. So there are different ways in which information and resources also get translated from Wikipedia and new resources um, tend to get created. Over the past, um, so this is again one of the things as to why you should host because art and feminism in the last 10 years has had a significant impact and over 20,000 people have taken part in editathons across the world. This also means that editathons like art and feminism are an excellent way to connect with your community that may or may not, you know, come to a museum originally. This is a time when museums, libraries, archives around the world are also looking for different innovative and participatory approaches to their collections. So art and feminism editathons fit beautifully with that mission of um, involving the 
involving members of the public to actually work with your collections, with your resources to create something and co-create with you. So um, really, this is one of the one of the big reasons why we feel that if you can add to the growing impact that would be really great for not only the movement but institutions as well um now this is the part when we get about to different questions when do we host how do we host so yes because of you know we we see art and feminism and the first connect that most people at different institutions or independently make is march Women's History Month, but it's not just history and not just women. We are an institution that um, supports many feminisms. So you're it's you're able to host any time of the year. Really, March is a great time. A lot of uh, you know a lot of events are happening at that point in time. But really, any any time of the year works. We also have a funding cycle, uh, so maybe that is something that informs your decision about when to host. Um, if you're looking to, for instance, host um, one event, a small, tiny event, um, or like just one event, maybe, art and feminism micro grants are ideal. Uh, so we have grants 200, I mean, we have different um, small grants which cover snacks and different kind of costs. This is there on the website. You will find that information and that grant cycle opens in February. Um, usually it, it, it's not like, um, it's an, it, it's a, it's a fund that is exhaustive. So if you apply and it's, it, if, if we are over with the fund, you're over with the fund, but the idea is that it opens in February. So the sooner that you plan, the chances are that you would have support from the art and feminism micro grant, uh, that said, we also have Wikipedia rapid grants, which are open all year round between the first and the 15th of a month. So if you apply in time, decisions are made by the end of the month. So for instance, you want to host in April, it is ideal that you apply a couple of months in advance. So you do know by a certain, you know, giving yourself a certain buffer time that you will have um, enough time. Um, an important thing is that rapid grants are up to $5,000. So usually we have also noticed that um, rapid grants are applied by institutions that are looking to do three, four, five different events. Uh, so that's also one of the things. Uh, you can check out rapid grants as well as uh, micro grants. There would be a different session, I'm sure, about funding. So today we're just discussing how to host, what do we really do in um, a session. So we're going to cover these different points, but if there is anything else, please do uh, drop in a question in chat or just raise your hand and we'll have you unmute yourself and shoot. So <clears throat> one of the things, I mean, we'll start with planning an event, um, the infrastructure and resources that you might need, the outreach, the facilitation, and some of the best practices that we recommend. Now, um, a few basic questions, of course, who is, your um, audience for this edit-a-thon? Um, is this going to be a small internal, uh, you know, just a staff only event? Because art and feminism does not really say that, oh, you must have a certain number of attendees. Um, it's about, you know, five people can sit together and be part of an edit-a-thon. It can be a room of 500 people. So really the scale, is something that you plan and you decide. So it can be for institutions or uh, anybody who's attending today on behalf of an institution, this can be a staff only event if you choose to keep it like that. Uh, if you're, if either of you, if some of you are, you know, hoping to partner with an institution, you can make this recommendation to them as well. It can also be something where the audience is a specific partner externally who's invited. So for instance, a museum or a library specifically collaborates with a university. In the past, we've had um, cultural institutions partner specifically with magazines and publishing houses. So that could be an external partner. Um, your external partner could be anybody. It could be one university, it could be, um, you know, an interest group, a civil society group, a nonprofit, and anybody really uh, who could be a, you know, it could be a specific partner, or it could be open to really anybody. So 
everybody is welcome to come edit so that's also a possibility so really one thing is to think of the scale at which you want to organize and who you want to open it up to um are you going to have any special guests and speakers join in or is it simply going to be an editing session where you know there's a short training session on how to edit and then everybody gets into editing so there are different ways to organize and this is a DIY campaign like we say so it's it's free for interpretation on the right, there is a screenshot that I've used from our um, Aryan Feminism's uh, webpage. So this is the list of people you can get in touch with from your region. If you don't see anybody from your region, just write into the team and um, we will find an ambassador from your region to help you, um, to help you find the right Wikipedians or someone to train you in Wikipedia editing. Because this is the next question. You know exactly how many people you want to invite. You know, this is how you want to do the event. But the quick question, the big question is, how do we edit Wikipedia? We don't have any expertise in that area. Or maybe you have like a couple of people in the team who know a little bit of Wikipedia editing, but are not sure what is to be done for the event. So what the regional ambassadors do is connect you also to a wikipedia community in your region so you know that you can ask all your questions to the right person to the wikipedian or the regional ambassador what we've also seen is that when we are planning the event there are a lot of groups that focus on a certain um, you know list because what are we going to edit really? Who are we going to edit? Which pages are we going to look at? And usually that aligns with the theme. It's absolutely all right to not have a theme, but you might like to think of whether you want to do say a theme like women in cinema or writers, you know, just can be a theme that brings people on the you know same page to think about a specific art form or an industry, something of this sort. We've also noticed that there are museums, libraries um, who have a full day editing session. So you start at 10, you end at 5, there is snacks, there is food, there are, uh, there's conversation in the middle, there's a performance sometime in the middle. So there are different kinds of programming, but it could also be like a short three hour or two hour editing session, shorter editing sessions, especially when you know that the larger um, audience who's attending uh, is a first time editor might might work out sometimes to just keep it short. Um, in the last couple of years, we've also recognized the value of this question. Are we doing an online edit editathon or are we doing an in person editathon based on where you are, um, what kind of situation it is? This is an important question. To answer. Uh, whether you're whether you have a physical space which would be comfortable for everybody, uh, whether you know it it would have all the health and safety protocols in place, different kinds of uh, considerations that come with hosting in hosting an in person event versus an online event. Um, also, <clears throat> whether you're looking to host an editathon in a single language or multiple languages. It could be both, it could be either or. So these are just a few questions and prompts to help you think. Uh, of course, there are lots of other questions as well. Uh, do you want a closed group? Do you want to cap, like, you know, uh, cap it at a certain number of participants? Those are all different kinds of questions that as an event organizer, you might have um, thought of while organizing any other event really. Um, <clears throat> and so just as an example, I also want to share this is an archive uh, which is which is uh, National Institute of Design, which is a premier university in India, and they also have an NID archive. So they were one of the first first archives to formally host editathons over a summer lab, over like over various sessions, because for them it was more of a thing for it also closely. Um, worked with how students were working with digital humanities and different kinds of digital projects within the university and within the archive as well. So looking at the information gaps about women in design, uh, 
there were these different sessions that have been organized. Again, these, if you just, you know, take a quick look at the poster, you will see that there was an editathon, but there were also panel discussions. And there was a series of panel discussions just to bring students um, knowledge up in terms of people who are writing about helping them access um, information resources about those designers in question who they were going to write about. Um, that's just one of the examples. This is an example of um, the Danish Culture Institute that was hosting. Um, there was a magazine that was involved, a digital magazine, a cultural institution. Uh, there, this was a multilingual um, editing session. So there was Danish editing as well as English editing that was happening. Um, what you definitely need is Wi-Fi uh, so that everybody can connect to it and actually work on their editing session. Uh, so again, depending on your Wi-Fi needs and uh, the Wi-Fi infrastructure, you probably also understand about uh, how many people you can actually host. Uh, the seating, again, there are different ways of there are a couple of photos that we have, but on Wikimedia Commons, you'll find a range of photographs from art and feminism from over the years, just to give you like a visual idea of what it really looks like. Important to have charging cords and you know points available so that participants who are bringing their own devices are able to plug in. Um, and there's a screen to demonstrate the editing process. We'll also come to resources, but before that, I just want to show you that it could also just be a classroom setting, like, like in this case over here that you see. It could also be like on the left, this is a spread out space. On the right, you see this one is, is a foyer, a, a hall that has been, you know, where, where tables and chairs have actually been put over there to host people. So there are different ways. Um, there's a screen, there's a stage-like setup. Really depends on what kind of infrastructure you can have access to. Now comes the question about resources. Now, when volunteers are editing pages, of course, they have information um, online, the, in the different sources that they can refer to. And in the training session, they will cover uh, how to differentiate and distinguish between reliable sources online. But what we've also noticed in the past is uh, how institutions give out their resources. You can also give out resources as Google Drive folder. This is, this is something that I thought we can share from one of the uh, editathons that I've hosted personally, uh, where we have an Excel sheet. So this needs prior preparation. So you, we work on this at least a month in advance to share the, the first column. The A column is, you know, all the names of the artists who need a page or who have a page, but uh, the page is short needs illustrations, needs citations. So there's also the wiki status that is given in column C. Um, and then of course, there's a column right on the, on the right, on the extreme right, uh, which is external links and resources. So we have a drive folder. So for instance, once we partnered um, with, uh, you know, we partner, we partner with different institutions, but once we partnered with a gallery, they actually scanned and kept all their catalogs in one folder. There was another museum that scanned and kept specific pages for specific artists in that folder. So it's nice to just give out links um, so people can access those books and specifically those resources. But if you're hosting at a library or a museum, it's it's good to just keep those books out. Um, there have been challenges that institutions have faced where they might not be allowed to, or if it's not right to give out the library books everywhere in, in that kind of a setting where you don't know if people will be careful or not. There are different considerations that different institutions have had in the past, uh, which, is, which is perfectly understandable. So we do recommend that we create photocopies of those pages and distribute and keep um, just, you know, to share those resources with any, everybody who's attending in a, in a convenient manner. Um, to conduct the actual edit-a-thon, there is again a wiki user group page. So on Wikipedia, there is, there is a user group page with details. 
it, this is just a screenshot of that page, but that page has like a lot of Wiki user groups. So whether it is um, Wikimedians of the Latvia user group, you could just click on a particular user group and the names of all the, the Wikipedia uh, usernames of all the members of that group are there. So whether it's a particular city that you're organizing in or a region, a specific country, you'll always find an expert Wikipedia in that region who can help facilitate um, your editathon and do an instructional um, ses session for beginners um, or participants who might be editing for the first time or uh, who are coming for your event. Um, of course, it's advisable to invite press or any special interest groups who would cover or who might even have resources to offer, uh, you know, who, who might uh, complement the nature of your event really. Uh, in the past, we've had publishers who have partnered with editathons to just bring in their books, share you know, share previews, share, you know, different kinds of, uh, you know, translations. There, there has been like a range of material that we have had, uh, you know, exposure to just by partnering and inviting different groups of people to a particular editathon. But of course, it's not just about having people edit Wikipedia pages or uh, upload pictures to Wikimedia Commons or doing a gallery. It could also just be going around a museum, doing a gallery walk, a museum walk. This is a picture from the MoMA, but uh, it could also be that, you know, you're taking pictures of artists uh, in your region and uploading them. That could also be part of your campaign. It could also be something creative, like making zines, making, uh, you know, really making something. Um, or, or capturing your learnings of the editathon into a zine. Uh, Art and Feminism has hosted zine making, um, but other workshops as well. So uh, we are always looking for different ideas and uh, to be inspired. So if anyone has any creative ideas, this is the time to like share them also. Um, but yeah, there are different ways to go beyond an editathon and uh, club them together with, um, you know, panel discussions, screenings, different kinds of things. And now the best part about um, the editathon, the food and the swag. But no, that's really not just the best part, but we do recommend that there is always food, snacks, and some swag at any editathon that is taking place. These are just things that make the community happy, make the editing process memorable. Just, uh, I mean, we all always connect over food. So I, I am a I'm a big uh, advocate of having food at editathons. It, it's always got a different vibe, those editathons. So um, some of the best practices are that we at Art and Feminism also have videos and tutorials on how to edit Wikipedia, how to upload pictures to comments, but you can always keep those handy, but also print out your own resources if you want to you know, uh, put it in a certain uh, way and share it with your audience. This is from the Asia Art Archive. I really love the little um, handbook that they have filled with illustrations and little pointers. So it's like a little keepsake. So these are the kind of things that you can do to ensure that whoever is coming for your um, editathon and if, it, if they're joining after a training session is already over, they still have a way to catch up and understand how to edit Wikipedia or, you know, whether it's a digital link or whether it's a printed handout, it's it's always nice to have um, different resources. Um, one of the things is definitely uh, that before participants come to the editors on, they must um, ideally sign up for a Wikipedia account if they don't have one, because a lot of people signing up from the same um, uh, same IP address location can sometimes cause a bit of a delay snag. So just to avoid all of those. Um, and of course, having health and safety protocols in place. Um, one of the things that we really love doing during an editathon is taking pictures. And but before we do this, we must take um, I mean, we must take permission from our participants. 
this is something that as organizers you could do formally by just circulating a media consent form or uh, there are a lot of organizers in the past who have circulated uh, stickers so if you don't want to be um, you know if you don't want to be photographed or be included then you just a red sticker you know so on your armband or something so you can think of different ways to take consent from your participants uh, we at rn feminism use hashtag now editing af hashtag rn feminism these are the related hashtags that we use to just keep up with different pages that are being edited so whether it's on social media or whether you're documenting this on a uh, video or you know writing a report about it we'd love to hear we'd love to see because that's how we also get inspired to just understand the different kinds of events that have taken place around the world um and yes also just do encourage the participants also to share their work uh, that in the past, we've seen participants create illustrations later on for their work. Um, there was another editathon where there was also a contest with a tablet company to just see uh, the different kinds of illustrations that come up about women artists who are not represented on Wikipedia and do not have a photograph with which their page can be illustrated. So those can be different ways to harness the creativity of your community and everyone who's participating in a small way uh, of course we always always um, suggest that the values of our feminism are you know shared amidst the larger community so of course I, while i'm sharing this with you today we also hope that you will take a moment to download the safety toolkit the anti-racism policy you know our value statements and share them with um, your participants because at the end that's how we work and um, it's it's the ethos of these events that really brings a participant back sometimes as an organizer so really with 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 that i just wanted to um, take you over these different examples but i do want to spend the rest of the time discussing your ideas or your questions um, with you also uh, maybe we can open the floor to any questions and if you have if you want me to go back and um, you know go into detail about something i can because i know i do tend to go a little fast so um, i'm happy to go back and revisit the presentation and um any anything else that i might have missed and i also just want to say that my colleagues are here in the room so uh juliana michaela uh jude akira uh, if, if there are questions we're all here to answer so please just Put them in the chat box. Um, Okay, I'm just going to maybe ask, is, is there anybody who's organized before and wants to share how you organized or is everyone here like a first time hopeful, uh, you know, first time organizer, hopeful to organize? It's just eager to hear from you all. Madhavi, there's a question in the chat about meetups. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can one organize meetups instead or a panelist discussion to engage female activists? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, Kira, do you want to add something to this? We have seen those in the past, absolutely. Yes, uh, we actually have um, all different kinds of event types that can be organized through art and feminism. I'm going to put into the chat uh, a link that kind of describes those various kinds of um, events that can be organized. 
and I and, and I do think that meetups and panel discussions are also such an excellent platform to find out about, um, say, for instance, other women activists who we've not known about or you know who may or may not have a Wikipedia page. So absolutely, Pritika, uh, you say that you'd like to participate in an editathon for organizing one. Um, <clears throat> Uh, yes, again, the same um, link, I think, um, rnfeminism.org events. I think, Pritika, you're based in Chicago, US, but you said, and we do have a lot of events in the US. Um, Kira, uh, would we have a list? We do have a list on um, rnfeminism.org. If you just hit the events tab, you will find an event that's happening and maybe just register for it. Um, and all the best for organizing one. That would be really great. Um, Mansi says, um, how do you organize your participants to work towards a team? Is it curated, directed, or let's just find information? Um, uh, personally, as an organizer in the past, I have um, felt uh, it to be a good idea to have a team and also prepare a list of uh, people who are, uh, you know, of pages who we should edit or, or those pages that do not exist and must be created. Uh, so that is a way that is really popular also. But um, again, uh, there, is, there is really no set rule around it. So it can be, it can be anything. So I, I, uh, you'd mentioned earlier. So for instance, there are organizers who've just picked up on a city. So for instance, they just say women architects of this city. So it, it could just be as narrow as that or as broad as women architects and that they could be anywhere in the world. So it could just be that. Also, Wikipedia has, you know, these different categories. So if you look at women by occupation, and then you'll see that there are women photographers, women architects. So if you just see those pages, for instance, then, um, uh, you know, you'll probably get an idea of uh, the different categories and themes that one can also work with. Um, so yeah, it, it could be curated and directed, but it could also just be a let's find information about women in history, culture, art, theater, anybody, and then let's just edit. So it could really be that. In the past, uh, I also want to say that there has, there has been an, uh, a time that I noticed where an organizer was actually crowdsourcing a list of um, people's names that should be on Wikipedia and is not. And I think even Wiki Women in Red do it at some point. That's a sister project on Wikipedia. So yeah, there are those times also that as an organizer, you can crowdsource this list with your community. Um, oh, great. Um, you would like to organize an outreach edit-a-thon um, in Eastern Nigeria, a translate-a-thon focused on women. That's, that's an Excellent idea. Um, and um, Miracle says, I want to organize an African fashion display with different panel discussions about different issues affecting women. Is this a good idea? Everything is a great idea, really. But yes, um, this could be a panel discussion or meetup. I, I would say, um, I mean, I have attended a lot of panel discussions and few meetups and they both have a different vibe. Uh, so uh, I, I think it would be really nice to see the different kind of energy that you, you want to go with. But uh, yes, I think having panel discussions uh, about issues affecting women, there are, I, I just want to highlight that there are Wikipedia pages, which also are not just about specific biography. I mean, they're not biography pages, but there are also pages about issues or campaigns or causes. So those could also be, um, you know, maybe something on the side, if you're not planning an edit, it's on as the highlight, but maybe something later to look at. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's my thought, but I'm also eager to hear from my colleagues, Juliana, 
Jude, Kira, Mikhaila. Mikhaila is not here, sorry. I think. <clears throat> but it would be so interesting to have an African fashion display with different panel discussions. And it's, it's, it's like uh, there is an exhibition, uh, a, like a display as well as um, different panel discussions. That is so interesting. Um, well, I've also found this very inspiring to just also see the different events that take place year after year, but uh, just uh, something that I really love doing is looking at the different posters and, you know, things that have come up during different years of art and feminism and uh, those can give you an idea as well as to the different kind of events that, uh, you know, that have been hosted, that have been, um, I think that have been uh, one open mic sessions that have been uh, different kinds of there has been a pecha kucha that has been held alongside an editathon so there are there are just so many different ways to celebrate um, and like I said again hosting is not about check marking or tick boxing that oh we had this much of an impact in terms of numbers but really it's about the connection you make with your community that is the success story of hosting an art and feminism event. In the past years that I have uh, been the regional ambassador of South Asia, I've seen different organizers and the kind of relationships that they have built with their community. And uh, it's just been fascinating. So for instance, there's the Kerala Museum who's hosted year after year for like three years, four years. And it's just that their relationship with not only the Wikipedia community has strengthened, but also with their local community. Um, and and it's, it's just been a joy to see how different it has been for them year after year. So it's really about the relationship that you build with your community. But I'd also say that this is um, a great way to have resources from different institutions, you know, come in and contribute their resources. So if one wants to apply for a fund for 50 plus participants, how can we get support from Art Plus Feminism? Will one work with the regional ambassador before submitting the application? Um, you may get in touch with your regional ambassador who would be able to definitely guide you on filling the form and applying. Uh, one thing is that, um, you know, when you're applying after uh, your grant period, you also have to fill a post form. Kira, am I right on that? I don't remember the... Yes. Um, yes. So you do have to fill a form later. So your regional ambassador is really the best person and best position to help you, remind you, send you those reminders. So it's good to keep them in the loop because even if you write to Art and Feminism's team directly, you would be connected to your regional ambassador. That's just how we work. So um, yes, reaching them directly would be the best option. And yes, I think if you can apply for a fund for 50 plus participants, you, you would be able to um, get the right guidance, depending on also the total amount that you're looking at. Uh, so yeah, that would be a consideration whether you're applying for a micro grant or a rapid grant, which is the rapid grant is directly from Wikimedia Foundation. And if I just may mention, um, if, if you're looking to uh, apply for this grant individually, you can do so. So it's absolutely all right too. <clears throat> Um, the, I didn't quite get your question, the rapid grant. Oh, if you want to apply for a rapid grant, um, if you want to apply for a rapid grant, uh, you can do so directly. You don't have to um, talk to your regional ambassador for it, but um, it always helps to 
keep them in the loop so they can just guide you best if there is uh, and support you with anything else that you might need um so yeah but you don't yes it's not like a requirement that for the rapid grant that you must speak to your regional ambassador You want to create awareness in Eastern Nigeria, which will need enough fund for that. Okay, yes. All the best. I, I, I'm sure this would be, um, I think Wikipedia is a very supportive community. So if you do apply for a grant that you will receive feedback, you will get support and guidance on how to make your application stronger um, so that your impact is maximized. So just make sure that you're leaving enough buffer time for any back and forth or any questions that the Wikimedia Foundation team has for you regarding your grant, uh, because usually there is a question that they might have. And yeah, you just want to keep a little bit of buffer time for all your planning. Sure, anytime. Okay, there's another question. Does building up a culture of mini editathons with, I guess, mini intro projects leading up to a mega project, mega editathon sound like something you've done before? Um, yes, the example that I took, um, NID, they actually did that. They did a series of small editathons, and um, I think the archive did have its own um, final. Um, I, I don't think they called it a mega editathon or something, but yes, there was a point where all the working groups came together and they finally did one session as well. Um, I can uh, maybe say that a good idea would also be uh, to look at rapid grant applications or, um, you know, that others may have submitted on Wikipedia just to you know, it's a very transparent thing. So if you write rapid grant art plus feminism, you will find a range of different projects that um, people have applied for grants for. And uh, it will give you the kind of structure they used in their program. Uh, but yes, it's not unheard of that there are a series of mini editathons leading up to a big one that's, that's absolutely doable. Um, personally, um, I run the Heritage Lab and we've done this during the pandemic uh, where we had weekly editathons on different themes. But again, we did not have like a, like a mega editathon, but at the end, what is achieved is achieved at every editathon. So, yes. Um, yes, you could reach out to me directly too if you need any help and you know if you want to just brainstorm i'm available i'm just going to put down my um email address here though you can find it on the art and feminism website as well um but yes i'm just an email away for anybody who wants to brainstorm uh, the the whole goal at art and feminism is a team that we all have is to help ensure that there are different well-meaning good campaigns that are taking place around the world. So if there's anything we can do to help, please do feel free to reach out. Thank you. This has been really wonderful, um, you know, having this conversation. Um, so like I said at the beginning, I'm joining in from India and from where I am, it, the, the session is planned for 9.30 in the night. So I was very conscious that this would be a post dinner session. And I was wondering if I will be able to keep up with the energy, but really thank you all so much for just being so amazing and for uh, you know sharing all your questions uh, because when there are lots of questions as a host, one feels just feel nice and relaxed that yay, we had more questions that we have. Um, yeah, we have interest from you all. So I'm really glad that we could do this. Uh, and I just want to jump in and also just echo Madavi's um, 
gratitude for you all. I also want to highlight a couple other community hour sessions that we have coming up. If you or um, you have colleagues that uh, uh, primarily uh, communicate in Spanish or Portuguese, we're going to be hosting a very similar session to this in Spanish. And that's going to be on February 15th. I'm putting that registration in the in the chat. And then on February 28th, it will be in Portuguese. So that is also in the chat. And then two other um, community hours that are coming up soon that might be of interest to you. These two are presented in English. Uh, Madavi will actually be doing a session about how to make gifts. Uh, and that's going to be on February 9th. And then on February 13th, we're going to have a session about how um, wiki interlinking, which could be a really cool and easy way for you to edit or organize your first edit-a-thon. But I see there's a question, so I'm going to hand it back over to Madavi. Right. Thanks, Kira. So we will take a question from Pritika. Pritika, go right ahead. Is there an editathon and then an art plus feminism editathon coming up that we could join? An uh, online one that anybody can join. An online one. Oh, we'll have to check our events, but if you're signed up to our um, the art and feminism, if you've subscribed to our newsletter, you would. Yeah. Kira, do we send out? Um, sorry, I, I, yeah, we do send out information about different events, but. Uh, I think um, it would be. I, um, I think a lot of the editathons coming up are um, mostly in person, um, but I'm not sure if there are any that are also having like a hybrid, um, a hybrid or online presence as well, uh, but. Yeah, the, and also one of the things that we really encourage our feminism is kind of that like do it yourself and do it with others approach. And so it, it is possible that there's an event happening that uh, Madavi and I aren't currently aware of. <laughs> um, but there's, we do encourage all of our event organizers to um, post their events on our website, which is a great way to see uh, what's coming up. Um, um, so unfortunately, I don't know offhand any that are going to have a virtual component, but those they do happen, um, and we can try to let you know in particular uh, when might one might be coming up if it um, is highlighted. Great, thank you so much. Thank you all once again, and um, this is the tenth year of Arden Feminism, so. Even if you're not organizing, I really hope that you will join an editathon, participate in one, and just like join the celebration in a in in some way. So, thank you again for being here. Thank you, and thanks, Madavi. Thank you, Kira. Thanks, everyone. Good night.